Centuries of Oppression, The Road to 1918. Chapter 8, The Great Reform Act of 1832. The Great Reform Act was not so great as regards the working man or woman, but its intention was not primarily to extend the franchise. Its purpose was to correct flagrant partisanship inherent in the system for electing members of parliament. Most members nominally represented boroughs, but the number of electors in a borough varied widely, in some cases being merely a handful of people, these in the so-called rotten boroughs. It was common for the selection of MPs to be controlled by one powerful patron. Moreover, a single rich patron may effectively control multiple boroughs, up to 11 was known. These were known as pocket boroughs because they were in the pocket of the patron. In the hundred years before the Great Reform Act, one quarter of all the constituencies of England and Wales had had either no election or just one election. In those days, many elections were uncontested. The ruling classes effectively decided amongst themselves who would take a seat. The system was completely rotten. Thus, the limited intent of the 1832 Act was to clean up the more rotten aspects of the electoral process. This limited scope was in spite of popular unrest and radical calls for universal suffrage. Even as early as the 1810s, during which decade there was serious economic hardship. The bill travelled a rocky road, so rocky in fact that three bills were required before it was enacted. Failure of the first attempt in 1830 led to the dissolution of Parliament and a general election. The second bill passed the Commons in 1831, but bombed in the House of Lords, largely due to the bishops incidentally. This failure of the second bill led to serious rioting in Nottingham and Bristol. In Bristol, the rioters took control of the city for three days. The third incarnation of the bill received royal assent in 1832. How long the rioters may have been pacified by this, I don't know. But in truth, the Great Reform Act probably led to fewer working class men having the vote rather than more. The beneficiaries were the emerging middle classes. The motivations of MPs for bringing the 1832 bill were complicated to put it mildly, but democracy was not one of them. The British establishment had never recovered from the shock of the French Revolution and the fear of contagion spreading to England remained even at this period. The frequent working class riots added to the concern, as did the increasing unrest in Ireland. This was, no doubt, why the swing rioters were punished so harshly. Historians can argue amongst themselves whether Britain really was in danger of revolution prior to the Great Reform Act, but enough of the people that mattered in 1832 believed it, so the bill was passed. If that all sounds like a bit of a damp squib as far as the working man was concerned, well, not entirely. You can date the start of the decline of the power of the monarchy, the aristocracy and the House of Lords from that act. So ultimately, it worked for democracy, even though that wasn't so apparent at the time. Most MPs didn't think of democracy as a desirable objective in those days. Parliament would have been more concerned about maintaining order and upholding property rights. Democracy was a dirty word, fit only for the mouths of radicals. To illustrate how far Parliament was from an egalitarian mindset, consider what happened when Sir Francis Burdett in 1809 proposed a resolution in favour of universal suffrage equally sized electoral districts and voting by secret ballot to the House of Commons. His motion, 
found only one other supporter, Lord Cochrane, in the entire House. And what about female suffrage? John Stuart Mill's famous polemic of 1861-69, to The Subjugation of Women, is usually taken as the start of the serious women's suffrage movement. However, Jeremy Bentham had argued for female suffrage as early as 1817, and others shared his view well before John Stuart Mill. It is noteworthy, then, that women's suffrage was surfacing as a political issue when only 4% of adult men had the vote. The Great Reform Act itself was a blow to women, though, because it, for the first time, explicitly referred to male persons. It's interesting that this was the first explicit statutory bar to women voting. More of that later. <laughs> 